I would like to introduce Dr. Stanos. Uh, so I'm Steve Stanis. I'm a physiatrist and pain medicine specialist. I run the uh, pain services at Swedish. Um, usually I do lectures by myself, but it's good to have my team members with me. I brought two team members from Swedish, Katie Kabuji, who is going to talk about um, relaxation training, and Sonia Brash, um, who's going to do a demonstration in OT. Okay? Uh, just a quick background, and it's great to be in this room, and I was very happy that Dale and, um, and uh, the, the group um, invited me uh, and I talked to Robin, just kind of getting an understanding of the group. Um, as I'm a physiatrist, I, I did my residency in Chicago in, um, in, a, in a big rehab hospital. And prior to that, actually, my exposure to the advocacy world, separate from being, seeing patients in a spinal cord injury unit, head injury unit, was my dad was an old polio survivor. And it was so interesting to hear what Dora was talking about, the, her grandfather. And my father was a little different. It was more the polio epidemic that he lived through. But just seeing that impact on him. And then later on, how he worked with Easter Seals and these other groups. So um, advocacy to me has always been important. I think in medicine, we don't really realize it. Uh, we go through school. But it was really good to be invited to speak with you guys. And I want to really kind of give you a better background today of what's going on with regards to opioids and, and pain management. And I want to thank Dave for doing a great setup. Because uh, a lot of the stuff he talked about will make what I'm going to talk about a little easier, which is always nice. Um, so we'll go from there, OK? And then we don't have to go outside for the earthquake, right? Okay. I will say we had our pain course a couple years ago at Swedish, and there was a windstorm. Um, Joel Konikow is here, my colleague uh, that, grad, that used to work with us. Um, well, there was a windstorm, and there's no electricity during the course. So all the speakers had to get up and just talk. Do you think it was a better course? It was pretty good, right? OK, so no more slides. Yeah. OK. So we'll, I digress. OK, so we're going to talk about the public um, health challenges. Uh, we're going to go over a more of a pain primer. And Dave did a great job of that. But I'm going to try to tie it into how we link that to what our treatment approaches are going to be. Um, I will talk about the state initiatives. And um, again, he, Dave did talk about it, but kind of link it to what's happening. And really around the narrative, uh, Dave mentioned the billions of dollars that are going to probably happen with the settlements, but hopefully um, with the opioid lawsuits. But if you can think about any time in healthcare. Our patients are hearing about lawsuits, overdose. Those things are important, but also how can we teach them about pain and better ways to manage their pain too, and, and the link of that. And that's what I hope to accomplish here in the next 45 minutes. Um, we'll talk about the biopsychosocial approach, but really I want to spend time towards the end to actually demonstrating what we're doing at Swedish for our pain rehabilitation program. Um, and then we'll kind of go from there. So the goals are, we're going to understand the challenges of chronic pain. Are there challenges? Yeah, hallelujah. This isn't a revival, but what the heck. Um, when you leave today, we're going to say, I will have one tool to help decrease tension and calm my nervous system. Let's think about that. Uh, I will do Tai Chi exercise and move. How many of you guys have done Tai Chi before? Good. So that's good. Now, most of my people I ask that in healthcare presentations, there's maybe one or two people that raise their hand. OK. But we'll see how good you are, because Sonia's really good. OK. So the first thing, I think, for the impact of chronic pain itself, um, this came out, uh, HHS, uh, uh, the, there's a survey that comes out every couple of years um, where we actually look at the epidemiology of pain. And I think now there's actually more specific questions that maybe outline and define what a person with chronic pain is or who they are. Um, the numbers show that with chronic pain, um, 50 million Americans, so that's a, a quarter of the uh, population, report chronic pain. So that's pain over six months. The new term, I think is more specific, is high impact chronic pain. High impact chronic pain is defined as pain in the last six months, most of the days, that affects your function in your daily life. Those are the people that are coming to clinics that are getting treated. That's one in 12 Americans with chronic, um, high impact chronic pain. Okay, so I think and you're going to start to see those numbers and it will hopefully now be better from a government standpoint to actually monitor what interventions actually work. Okay, so high impact chronic pain, we know it affects people. Um, if you look at the same, and I know there's a question about the opioid, I mean, opioid use disorder treatment, there's 91 people prescribed opioids, and that was in 2015. Two million people with opioid use disorder. What percentage of the two million with opioid use disorder actually have behavioral health in their treatment? What percentage of that two million people actually are on buprenorphine or MAT therapy? Actually, still pretty small. Okay, but I'm not going to have enough time to go through about that, but just to get us an understanding of the complexity. If you think of pain, and I, again, Dave talked about it, but I think of pain as the threat to the biologic integrity. How many of you have ever woken up in the morning and you stub your toe going to the bathroom? Or something like that. Besides swearing, what happens right after that? It hurts. What happens a couple seconds later? It goes, it stops hurting, right? OK. So that's an important sensory phenomenon for you. Suffering is really the, that's this really complex change over time. 
and where it changes the person. And uh, Cassell talked about this many years ago. He introduced suffering to the medical community, that that threat threatens the intactness of what a person is, how they function, what they do. Okay, so really, how do we shift that? Yes, it's important to ask about pain, but what's, the, what's that link to their function? And like Dave said, some people maybe not even asking what their pain number is. Okay, so suffering's important and related to that depression, anxiety, catastrophizing, understanding previous traumas, that's also important. Okay, so we're gonna to try to talk about how we integrate that into treatment. If we think of pain itself, and again, we talked about nociceptive pathways, there's tissue factors, and unfortunately, with acute pain, like stubbing your toe, that trauma to those nociceptors, um, your nociceptors get activated, and then they calm down, right? Uh, unfortunately, with chronic uh, kind of impulses, that, that, that pathway changes, okay? So yes, there's pain, there's suffering, um, and like Dave explained, there's behaviors, guarding, grimacing, a lot of the compensatory parts. So with pain management, how do we focus on those behaviors to help pa identify patients what those behaviors are, and then how do we kind of unlearn those behaviors, okay? Kind of peeling the onion the other way. So uh, Dave mentioned the gate control theory. So really the gate control theory, uh, if you guys all banged your elbow on the table, what would happen? I don't think you guys are all trying to hurt yourselves, but you, you, you get a quick amount of pain, what would you do? Would you rub that area? So when you rub it, you're stimulating the large fibers. So the gate control theory came out in the 1960s, and Melzack and Wall were kind of poo-pooed when this first came out. Um, and they talked about you could modulate pain signals at the spinal cord. So rubbing the, small, the large fibers, so if you do that, you're inhibiting pain signals. And like Dave talked about, inhibiting descending inhibition. So that's where we were gating pain signals. Probably what was forgotten about the gate control theory was the other part. That, and then what Miles and Wall talked about this. The brain itself is always trying to increase descending inhibition. So if you're more depressed, more anxious, what happens to your pain response? It's elevated. Okay, so every time I ask patients about their pain, does what is increases, decreases your pain? When you're stressed out, what about, is your pain increased? Oh, yes. Right? And so patients can understand that. So again, this is important, these basic concepts, because when we talk about pain rehabilitation, we're teaching patients of these concepts as well, so they can understand it. Um, if we think of pain as a condition and person to person, the variability with patients, um, the Venn diagram can change. On the left, we have a patient, Jane, she reports eight out of 10 pain. Brian, on the right, eight out of 10 pain. She's on 10 morphine equivalents, he's on 100, okay? So we just explained two different objective things that they marked down on their chart. Those things, those two factors probably are not important, okay? Because what are the other parts of that Venn diagram? Is it the physical injury, depression, cognitive dysfunction, genetic susceptibility from one patient to the next? And that's the complexity of pain and the mosaic of pain and how people present. Okay, and so I, on one side, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the balance with opioids, because opioids can be effective for some patients. Um, uh, how do we kind of understand that? You know, uh, and what are the other treatments or what are the other things going on with that person? Okay, like I think was explained about the person's brain is on fire, right? Sensitization of the nervous system and how that infected that person versus the next person you see in clinic, very different background of what happened around their pain. So again, I think we are at this public health challenge and you know, we're using the term opioid crisis uh, and we had a, our course a couple weeks ago, Kathy Lofi from Department of Health presented and I think made a great point. This is really a drug overdose epidemic. Okay, it's not just opioids, amphetamines, cocaine, heroin, okay? So I think we need to be talking the same thing because there's a lot of issues with opioids, but there's these other things we need to understand as well, okay? So we have this, this, the, this crisis, these two public health challenges, doing our best as clinicians to limit people developing opioid use disorder and overusing medications and opioids for this case, or limiting the patients that need long-term opioids and develop other problems versus the other problems I told you about with chronic pain. Is chronic pain, and I think poorly managed chronic pain, a problem in our country? Yes, okay. So there's, um, this is shown a lot with uh, the uh, overdose um, numbers, and this is drug overdose, not specifically the opioids, and it breaks it down. There was three different cycles. The first wave was the increase in opioid prescribing in the 1990s. Yes, there was overprescribing of opioids, okay? Um, the second wave was the increase in heroin-related deaths, and within there, cocaine-related deaths have been increasing for a number of years. Heroin is cheaper, more potent, okay? Unfortunately, the third wave, as the prescription opioids continued to rise, was the um, uh, illicit fentanyl. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I talk to patients and I mention the term fentanyl, they know what fentanyl is. Two years ago, they didn't know what fentanyl is, and we're using fentanyl all the time in the hospital, right? But illicit fentanyl, this is super potent fentanyl, that unfortunately people with drug abuse problems, drug overdose, now are overdosing. It's so potent, 
Okay, and unfortunately, that illicit fentanyl is killing more people, and we see this um, significant spike. Okay, and if you heard in the last week, there's a number of stories about these poor teenagers that died with tainted oxycodone with fentanyl laced in it. This isn't from pharmaceutical companies. This is from clandestine Mexico, other countries, that these drugs are coming into the U.S., okay? And again, causing overdose and death. Unbelievable, right? Okay, so the, I think the fourth wave is where we are is called pharmacovigilance. Pharmacovigilance is, you, is a state of understanding. You look at a drug, let's say opioids, and then you develop policy that's balanced, okay? And so we'll talk about some of the misapplication of the CDC guideline around opioid prescribing. Um, so that's where I think we are as a society. How do we balance these things out? Okay, so I think in the past, maybe this is what a lot of people thought pain management was. Um, opioids and maybe a little non-pharmacologic. We gave it a little lip service, you know. And then where do we need to move to? Because a lot of the things we're going to talk about here in the next 30 minutes w has evidence. We've been doing it for a long time. How does it become actually the real standard of care? So incorporating physical therapy, occupational therapy, behavioral health, um, complementary, education, mind, body, those things can be done. Okay, and maybe in a small percentage of patients, opioids are still part of their treatment, or they need to be on one-tenth of the dose, okay? Um, so again, the, the key is, what, what was our problem? Was, did we put all of our eggs in one basket? And David explained, any drug trial, a billion-dollar drug, what do you think the average pain score is to get the drug approved? The reduction in pain. It's like one and a half points, whether it's lidocaine patch, pregabalin, you know, above placebo. What's, what's placebo? One and a half point reduction in pain is pretty much in a billion dollar drug. That's above placebo. What's placebo? Nothing. Someone says nothing. Placebo is an endogenous opioid response. <laughs> you know, I suggest to you pain relief. You think you're getting something. A lot of what we do in medicine is actually placebo. I always say placebo is good. Okay, but again, so any of these opioids, duloxetine, um, gabapentin, that's a regular drop. But unfortunately, what did our, the public think? That they'll take the pill, the pain's going to go away, right? Okay, so moving on, um, Dave went through, I and mean, we've had a number of guidelines, and I was in Illinois when the Washington guidelines came out, the first guidelines in the country that said patients on higher doses more than 120, something's, you have to stop and reassess those patients, okay? And then we know what happened with the AMDG guidelines, the CDC guidelines came out in 2016, we have the BRE collaborative, um, so I think a lot of good evidence-based guidelines out there. The question is, how do you use those the right way? Now, just in this last year, the uh, pain rules came out for a number of years in the state of Washington. There were chronic pain rules, okay, which again, kind of led the way across the country. The state of Washington was looked upon for the AMDG guides. And then they, over time, added addi additional ones. And in January of this past year, the new guidelines and the new rules came out for acute pain, perioperative pain, and subacute pain, as well as chronic pain. Because the state understands, if you're gonna under if you do a better job of limiting the problems with chronic opioids and chronic pain management, you have to do a jo lot better job at the front end. Okay, so now we have, we spent a lot of time, David and UW spent a lot of time just this past year trying to educate physicians, trying to educate health systems about the new rules. Okay, and hopefully that's gonna help decrease. And now some of the things that came up, um, there's limits for acute pain to seven days without documenting in the medical record, uh, 14 days for um, perioperative pain. So uh, how many of you, I won't ask you this, but how many have family members that have had surgery? And what happens when they come home? Do they get a lot of pain medicine? Oh, yeah. Heck yeah, right? Or someone knows you're a clinician, they say, oh yeah, I had this surgery and someone gave me 60 Percocet. I only used one and got sick. What'd you do with the other 59? Uh, put them in the medicine cabinet, right? Okay, so again, we have these, a lot of these unused meds out there. And so just limiting the amount of opioids prescribed in the hospital, 70 to 80% of meds that are prescribed in a hospital, op um, analgesics, are unused. And even a greater percentage, we don't know where we'd put them, <laughs> okay? So again, the, the, this is why we have these limitations, and is that gonna help decrease the uh, opioid getting in the hands of a recreational user that then develops an addiction problem, or a child having an accidental exposure, okay? So again, how do we be, approach this rationally? And that's why we have these rules. So again, unused medications, I think that's like low-hanging fruit. Uh, in, the city, in the state, we have takebackyourmeds.org. Uh, um, you type that in, you put your zip code in, and with a 10-mile radius, it can tell our patients where they can drop their meds off. At our at Swedish, every campus, we have a receptacle where you can actually re return any controlled substance. Okay? If I told people that two or three years ago, they'd be like, what are you talking about? Now it's very common. We're seeing more and more pharmacies being able to do that as well. So is that going to help you know, decrease um, the, uh, kind of the, the adverse effects of opioids and the impact on the community? So the CDC guidelines came out in 2016. Um, they talked about kind of three areas. There were 12 recommendations. Um, the first part was when to initiate or continue opioids. 
um, selection, opioid dosage, and the third part was what to do with high risk, patients developing opioid use disorder, um, giving naloxone. So a lot of the things we've been talking about for a number of years, but kind of codified it and put it together. And like David said, most of the CDC guideline was based on the AMDG guideline here in the state of Washington. Okay, but there was some controversy with it. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time with it because I think it's a good example of the benefits of advocacy to kind of straighten out some of the messaging and some of the impacts on, on this document. Okay? Um, and so what happened was the guideline came out. The guideline said it, uh, um, you know, limit, to three, limit for acute prescribing um, to three days or seven days. Um, if you have a patient on more than 50 morphine equivalents, you should reassess the patient. Morphine equivalents are the kind of the, how we quantify the amount of an opioid from one opioid to the next. If you're on more than 90, you need to carefully justify it and avoid increasing more than 90. Well, the, the pharmaceutical companies, the PBMs, the pharmacy be benefit plans, the payers, and even a lot of states kind of misapplied that recommendation. And then we started getting letters from uh, uh, insurers saying, oh, your patient's on more than 90 morphine equivalents. You have to decrease them down. There was this huge kind of misapplication of the guideline, and that led to adverse effects where patients were being forced tapered off opioids. There was an increased report of suicides and things like that. And only because of advocacy from the patient side, I think, in a lot of different groups, we were able to convince CDC and other groups, like, how do we do this in a more rational way? Okay, and so what happened was the CDC came out just this year and kind of re- uh, um, kind of made a statement and a publication kind of uh, clarifying the misapplication of a guideline. And I can't remember a national guideline ever having an additional paper to reassess and re-explain some of the issues around it. Okay, so it talked about misapplication recommendations um, outside the guidance scope. There were patients with cancer pain, palliative care, that the guideline didn't even apply to. The, they were being forced tapered or the insurers were saying we're not going to approve more than 10 pills. Okay, uh, as an example, misapplication of guideline, dosage recommendations, hard limits and cutoffs. Okay, and so there was never the intention of the guideline that there were hard limits and that patients had to be at a certain place. And so again, this was, you know, based on the, I think, you know, insight from a number of people and uh, really good advocacy to get this clarified for patients. Um, David explained to you that last week the um, tapering guideline came out from HHS. Uh, and within that, it also talks about how do you taper patients in, a, in an empathetic and compassionate way? Um, what are different ways you can do that? What are other interventions you can include? Okay, so I think now that there is this kind of over or misapplication of the guideline, and now we're doing the correction. And is that going to help patients? And at the same time, there's a lot around how do we improve chronic pain care, multidisciplinary pain care, okay? Um, so there was a group of um, clinicians and, and advocates actually wrote a white paper talking about the problems with the um, misapplication of the CDC guideline. Uh, this is from the New England Journal where the authors of the CDC guideline came out to do that kind of re um, uh, clarification of the guideline. Um, and there's actually FDA warning set out to all clinicians uh, stating that we can't force taper patients. That's not appropriate. There's been an increased risk of withdrawal, increased psychiatric problems, and suicide. Okay, so very strong wording, yet still a lot of confusion out there. So how do we educate our clinicians on what's the appropriate use of these medications? So I think what's important, though, separate from opioids, and again, a lot of the, the response to the opioid um, uh, overdoses and drug overdoses was how do we improve pain management? I think there's been more and more discussion of that, which is important. Um, the HHS uh, Interagent Task Force report came out. Um, this was part of the CARA Act of 2016, where at the high, this is at the highest level ever that the government has actually mandated a report be put, to, uh, put, be put together. Uh, the report actually looked at the gaps and inconsistencies we currently have with pain management, with opioid use disorder treatment, with research. Um, and that uh, HHS task force released their um, report. Uh, again, a lot of the things that the academic institutions have been saying for a long time, but I think really supports how do we do a better job um, at looking at pain, whether it's acute, chronic, opioid use disorder, uh, as well as public education, research, and all those things. Okay, so what's interesting with the HHS uh, task force report, they actually broke it down into five things. It wasn't this medicine first, then that medicine, and then PT, and then consider something else. They included all five of these medications, restorative therapies, which include physical therapy, occupational therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, interventional procedures, behavioral health approaches, and complementary integrative. All five of those, okay? Not we're saying all, every patient needs all of those, but how do you approach patients in that manner, okay? And then across that, a risk assessing patients, being worried about stigma, um, and was already mentioned about you know, significant um, um, inadequacies of how we treat patients with different backgrounds, let alone you know, socioeconomic and, and cultural as well. 
uh, as well as education, access to care, all of those things. So I think any of you who are doing advocacy, be familiar with the HHS Interagency Task Force Report because I think that's going to push payers. It actually has in there specifically that payers should start covering for team conferences. They should look at pain management similar like they look at disease management for diabetes. Okay, so how do you in include and incorporate at the primary care level disease management in team-based care for chronic pain and actually um, reimburse clinicians so they can do that work? Okay, because we can talk about a lot of these things, but if you're going to get zero money for it and you can't cover your expenses, it's going to be hard to offer that. Okay, so again, I think that's what's important. This is probably the highest level that we've actually put this back on the payers that they need to actually step up. Also, how to increase access to buprenorphine um, and really taking a serious look at increasing access for substance abuse disorder treatment, okay? Um, so again, they base on a biopsychosocial model because unfortunately our model before was biomedical. What's biomedical? Biomedical is based on tissue injury, right? The tissue injury is damaged. Once the tissue heals, your pain goes away. And we know with chronic pain, with sensitization, a lot of the things David talked about with the changes in the nervous system, um, you really need a biopsychosocial approach. And you don't need to use that approach five years later. You need to be thinking about that when patients develop acute pain. I mean, it's already been mentioned a couple of times. Previous history of trauma, psychiatric problems, family disorder. Do you think that predisposes patients to chronic pain? Yes. Do you think those things also predispose people to bad outcomes from surgery and everything else we do in medicine? Yes. So how do we look at that early on? Not, oh yeah, it's a year later, two years later. Okay, so with opioids, I think it's important. Um, I am in no way an opioid zealot, okay? But I just think there are patients that these medicines benefit. They are powerful analgesics. And now, like David said, we're starting to understand a lot more of the complexities, even though we've been using opium for millennia, right? So on the left are this, what opioids do. They cause analgesia, they cause pain reduction. Uh, they decrease anxiety. Uh, they can cause respiratory depression. They can inhibit your bowels from moving. So we know a lot of the effects on the left. On the right, I think are the more nuances. They, have re they can reduce anxiety, decrease boredom, decrease aggression, increase self-esteem. A lot of work even with social isolation with opioids kind of wrongly feeling people like they're less socially isolated, okay? So do you think on the right we have patients that are taking meds for a long time and that's what they're getting? They're not really getting that much analgesia. I get a lot of patients tell me, I take my Vicodin, whatever, and it drops my pain from a seven to a six and a half. Now most of us would say, well, why are you doing that? You've been doing that four times a day for like 10 years? but there's a reward, there's something else they're getting out of that as well, because the pain reduction is usually pretty small, okay? Or those patients that maybe the benefits, taking it three times a day, it helps their pain and their function's fine. That's, that's the tough part, is figuring out who's who, okay? Who develops some of these other complex problems over time. In the middle is the um, pathway from NIDA, which shows the kind of complexity of addiction, reward systems, closely interacts with opioids. Okay, so again, I don't want to go into all the details, um, but we have a lot of patients just with chronic opioid exposure, um, and David mentioned uh, cr chronic persistent um, dependence, uh, their nervous system kind of changes. Maybe it's not all patients, but they actually opioid starts doing more harm than good. But we can't figure out which patient that is. Okay, so how do we do a better assessment? So again, I think you know, opioids themselves may be part of the treatment plan, but not the plan, and that's where I think patients got in trouble. And we have a lot of patients we've seen, they never really had a good physical exam, a thorough assessment of the psychologic issues yet they were put on a therapy and just stayed on that. And maybe that's all they knew, right? Or that's all they were um, uh, given. So these are the CDC guidelines. Again, I don't want to go into a lot of detail about it, but just to understand, the first recommendation of the CDC guidelines says, opioids are not first line. And they actually talk about the benefits of multidisciplinary treatment and that those things should be used. And then the HHS Pain Agency Task Force took that to the next level. So I think all of these guidelines and things are really pushing that towards the right direction it needs to go. And actually, of all of the 12 recommendations, which one do you think had the strongest evidence? The first one that said that multidisciplinary treatment actually has the most evidence. Multidisciplinary being active therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychology, okay? Um, so again, I just kind of want to highlight that. So we look at it as a biopsychosocial uh, problem. What's the patient history? What's their physical exam show? Most of our patients with chronic back pain, they have trigger points in their buttocks with radiating pain. They have loss of motion in their spine. They have limit in their hip flexion. They're not sleeping well. It's not usually just one thing, okay? But how do you do the physical exam to really assess what's really happening, okay? Um, and looking at the patient history and putting that all together, okay? And then with that, and this is from the HHS uh, task force, more related even to opioids, and then kind of stratifying patients, maybe patients with no risk factors, they're low risk for problems with opioid medications. 
I kind of look at this risk stratification as also a way of not just for opioids, but for chronic pain. So now a big focus in teaching clinicians how to look at those risk factors with each of your patients. And so your low risk patient, maybe you would approach that differently versus the high risk patient. You know, I have patients that have severe back pain, disc herniation, they have a history of alcoholism, they've been clean and sober for 20 years. Do you think they're at higher risk for developing problems? Right? So how do we approach that person versus the other person that has really no risk factors, but you know, the, the, again, the, underscoring the individuality and the variability from patient to patient. So with that in mind, you know, I kind of think of pain management, and unfortunately pain management, there's some pain doctors that say we just do procedures. Uh, I don't write medicines, or I just do yoga, or I just do this, okay? Versus how do we figure out what are all the pieces that someone needs, or how do we get those three different groups working together? Okay, so from a pain management's perspective, like in our clinic, we have a procedure suite. Do we have spinal cord stimulation? Uh, we have an addiction specialist that works with our patients. Um, we also have our pain rehabilitation program. So really, that should be what pain management is. And how do we really get that to be more standard of care versus you know, tertiary and quaternary care, that you need to go to the specialty hospital for that, okay? So um, medical management, interdisciplinary care, which we're gonna talk about our functional restoration program, complementary and integrative care, um, which has been talked about, and addiction medicine, okay? And how does that work within a whole system? And how do we communicate that with our emergency department, with our primary care clinics, with the specialist, versus everything being siloed, which we hear a lot about in healthcare, right? The silos and it doesn't work and you kind of bounce around. Okay, so how do we really make pain management, disease management approach across the system that it can actually work? Okay, and I think Dave brought up another good point, a person that told that history over and over again, over and over, right? I mean, there's so many things we could do to make this easier and, and more kind of streamlined for our patients. So there's a different continuum. So in primary care, like in Swedish, we have, fortunately, we have integrated behavioral health in all of our primary care clinics. So you can see a counselor, you can see a psychologist, you can see a psychiatrist in most of the clinics. Do you think our primary care doctors are having an easier job doing things? My wife's a pediatrician. She works uh, on the Issaquah. Do you think she has stressed out young moms that aren't sleeping, that aren't rational? <laughs> okay, and she can say, oh, you're going to talk to our counselor today. You know, it seems like you're having problems. It's not here. Call and make an appointment in three weeks. Okay, so how do we integrate behavioral health? And that's been very successful. We don't have enough behavioral health people, though, <laughs> right? Um, and then how do we teach those behavioral health people to understand what we're doing in our pain clinic? and teach the same language and how we talk about things and, and understand pain. Okay, so that's the one level. At the primary care level, a multidisciplinary would be interventional therapies, um, addiction medicine, or I'm in private practice and I have a good uh, therapist that does yoga that I'm gonna refer a patient to and I have a good psychologist that I can send someone to. Okay, so, or is it gonna be interdisciplinary, which we're gonna talk about at Swedish, we have it all under one roof, a pain rehabilitation program. Okay, so, um, so I wanna I'll give you one patient Okay, this is our 63-year-old, this is Don. He's got rheumatoid arthritis, lumbar spondylosis. He had an L3 to sacrum fusion. Okay, he's got chronic renal disease, COPD. He's on oxygen at night, uh, and he's on chronic prednisone. Do you think this is an easy person? Even without any medical background, okay? One of my most grateful patients, too, right? And I, and I said, what did you say? Oh, he's an old lumberjack, and he lives 50 miles away from our clinic and he drives in with his wife, okay? He's in the hospital three or four times a year with all sorts of different medical comorbidities. And he's got horrible rheumatoid arthritis, and he can't take any of the other biologics. So what do I tell him? Uh, sorry, I can't help you. Opioids are bad. Move, right, okay? So how do I do a couple of those things, right? How do I say, I'm gonna get you in a little more PT, or we're gonna have you take your medicines more appropriately? And he was actually on low doses of opioids for his rheumatoid arthritis and severe knee pain. Okay, or when he goes in the hospital and he's septic, how do I coordinate with the doctor in the hospital to help take care of his pain? Okay, because what did you think he thought when he went in the hospital? They're not gonna be able to treat my pain, right? Or they're gonna think I'm drug seeking. Okay, so again, I'm just bringing up one patient just to try to understand some of those complexities. Okay, so with that in mind, I wanna talk about our pain rehabilitation program. I've got my colleagues with me. So our, we have an interdisciplinary pain program at Swedish. Patients are evaluated. They see the physician for an hour. They see our psychologist for an hour. So it's a two hour evaluation. From that, do you think we learn a lot about the patient? Heck yeah, and luckily the psychologist sees the person before me. So when I walk in the room, I know a lot of what's going on with the patient. Okay, and then we do our exam and then we decide if they need one of our pain rehabilitation programs. So I thought this would be a good model to talk about team-based care. 
I'm not here to say that every person should do a functional restoration program, even though I think we all should, even if we don't have pain. <laughs> okay, because so we'll talk about that. So what it is is patients are there, say, three days a week. Um, say, in this case, it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We have a whole curriculum that the pa our nurse puts together, um, that, uh, education, sleep hygiene, uh, diet. Um, a lot of the things that clinicians try to talk about, we don't really know that well, um, but really education to, that they guide through in the program. And then at every hour, they see a different discipline. So we take four patients. Every hour, they see a different discipline, physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychology, relaxation training. They do that twice a week individually, and then one of the days in the middle of the week, they're in a group setting. Okay, who talked about social isolation? Do you think this helps with social isolation? Okay, and, and when I try to explain the program to a patient, what do most patients say? And I tell them it's going to be four weeks. What do they say? That's a lot. I don't have time. Okay? Well, I always kind of think in the back of my mind, well, that's like one refill, okay? Because it's a month, right? <laughs> but how do I get them to understand that, right? But if I spend an hour on their exam and they talk to the psychologist, do you think they have a little more insight that maybe these guys can help us out? Okay? So our program, um, we're going to go through the components of it, but I think it's interesting when they finish the program, and they see the physician once a week, and we can help with their meds. We can decrease their opioids. It's a good root kind of structure to help detox somebody as well. Or we have a lot of patients on meds they shouldn't be on separate from opioids. They're on three antidepressants. They're on four muscle relaxers. I mean, a lot of stuff accumulates. So how do we clean up their meds first, OK? And whether it's the opioid issue or not. So this is the program. Uh, they do the program for four weeks. Um, every day, we're giving them different stuff to work on. Um, and then they come back um, at four months after, um, a month after the program, they actually see the whole team and check in. And then they continue to work with the physician. So just quickly, just to go through the disciplines, because I want to give time to uh, Sonia and, and Katie. Physical therapy works on movement assessment. Um, do you think most of our patients have had physical therapy in the past? And what have they said about physical therapy? It doesn't work. It made my pain worse. Or maybe on the other side, we have patients that have been in physical therapy twice a week for six years. I'm like, maybe that's not appropriate. That's probably the only nice person they are interacting with, it, right? Maybe that's good, right? But I digress. So our physical therapists really try are, are tying in not just exercises, but what Katie's going to talk to you about with relaxation and um, uh, Tai Chi and doing mindful stretches. Okay, so there's a lot of overlap, what we call transdisciplinary. The PT knows what the OT is doing. The relaxation therapist knows what the psychologist is doing. And me as a physician, I'm trying to kind of keep pushing everybody. Okay, so then they work on strength and aerobic um, neuromodulation, neuromobilization, so a lot of impairments that we can work on with patients. And then give them an exercise program that actually works for them or that's not going to take two hours a day to do. Or they're going to use certain stretches when their pain's flared up versus what's their daily stretches. And really educating them is the key. Okay, and we really focus on education. Do you think physicians underestimate what patients can understand. Yeah. It's been shown across the board, OK? So even complex things, like the basic things about gait control, stress-pain connection, teaching patients about that. Like David said, the person he talked to, just understanding them, that, 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 that analogy told the story about the brain being in pain or on fire, that person felt better. So education is the key. The key is, unfortunately, for pain, if you think about spine care, we taught it the wrong way. We taught it that it's all mechanical. And so our education is more what's called pain neuroscience education, where we teach them about their nervous system. We teach them how central sensitization happens, how with chronic pain your nervous system changes, and how that affects different tissue. We teach them those concepts, as well as muscle, nerve, and those kind of um, ideas. Do you think then they, the exercises then start making better sense? OK. So pain neuroscience education, a lot of physical therapists are getting trained in that area. And there's also an overlap with some cognitive behavioral interventions with pain neuroscience education. OK, so these are the stretches. We keep it simple, cat, camel. I was going to have you guys get on the floor and do this, but I'm waiting for the people to come out for the earthquake, but that didn't happen. Um, so we already have these guys going to do some different things. But I've had a room of 200 people doing cat, camel on the floor. So I just didn't, there's some legal stuff here. I didn't want you guys to have to sign. Um, but how do we show them how to do this? We have a lot of patients. Yeah, I'm like, are you doing your exercises? Yeah, can you show me three? Uh, no. It's like, wait, you've been going to physical therapy for like three months. So do you think the next time they come back in? or we're showing them these exercises, and we're incorporating these other things. OK, I don't think I have a bad attitude. OK, so for occupational therapy. Um, so Sonia, you want to stand up here? So occupational therapy um, it focuses on not upper extremity strength, but posture, pacing. I'm saying this with like, it's like giving a sermon at church and Jesus is standing next to you. Hold on. So pacing <laughs> techniques, set goals and improve activity tolerance. Activity of daily living, dressing, bathing. So Sonia sees the patient. She goes through all of those things, getting an assessment of what the person's doing. Okay, um, And it's interesting, and she probably can comment better, patients are so surprised of what they're not doing. They kind of totally forget about their past activities. 
Okay, so we, we highlight that, sleep hygiene, therapeutic movements, Tai Chi, that's what she's going to show us. So we're actually delivering Tai Chi with her occupational therapy visits, okay? Sonia, I'm getting, getting you ready here, okay? So Sonia is going to do a Tai Chi demonstration. So everyone stand up for a second. You have your, um, yeah. And if you don't want to do it, you don't have to, okay? Uh, and, and the other part, just so as you get stretched out before she does her demonstration here, she also goes over time management, um, uh, looking at activities, what increases or decreases the pain, uh, how do you manage pain, working on tolerances, ergonomic avals. So all of that's incorporated in kind of what's more traditional occupational therapy. But then the other half is with Tai Chi and movement. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. You don't, so do you hear that, Sonia? Maybe we'll have to stand on the table. Wait, okay. She's going to describe it. Oh, no, yeah, you want to just do it since I'm going over. So you want to get into it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so. Oh. Yeah, can, you, can people, you know what, Sonia? You want to go kind of in the middle, maybe? Sorry. I don't know if that's going to help. She's going to explain this. It's, uh, Right, so Sonia? Tai Chi it, it's very evidence-based. Harvard has a book that's 12 weeks of Tai Chi, and it gives uh, chapters of benefits of Tai Chi, flexibility, balance, activity tolerance, uh, helps with stress, anxiety. Uh, and then I, what I do is I um, have a program for the patients, uh, a YouTube uh, with, uh, it's Don uh, Fierro, Don for you, oh gosh, Fiori, yeah, yeah. Fiori. <laughs> and so then they can watch and practice at home, so they can learn the movement. So it's just basic movements, uh, four minute qigong, nine minute tai chi, and then if they want more resources, I give them resources in the community of where they can find tai chi classes. Um, Dr. Paul Lamb has a website, tai chi for health uh, institute.org, who is a retired family physician in Australia, has 40 years experience, uh, instructs uh, instructors all over the country, all over the world. And so you can find instructors in the area here where you can send. And these instructors are able to modify movements for folks. So that's the good thing is that they're going to help modify. And so, uh, so I'm going to show you the kind of the routine that we, I do with my patients. And we're gonna do about three movements of each. So we're gonna start off with just four movements of Qigong and then nine movements of Tai Chi. Very basic and it's good. Yeah, it's just basic and then they can, it can always get harder. I told them we can always do more. They can, always, you know, so. So she's gonna show you just a couple because we only have like five minutes. Oh, we do, okay, so. Yeah. All right, That's so I guess I'm only gonna show you things. Like, oh, okay, so, so I'm not sure how I'm gonna do that, but. Okay, so I'll show you two of the Qigongs. So uh, feet, um, Parallel, knees soft, shoulder width apart. Um, really pretend like your arms are like uh, feathers. You want effortless movement. Also what I incorporate with the patients, um, with what Katie's working on diaphragmic breathing is their diaphragmic breathing while they're moving. And so again, Harvard coins this meditation in motion or medication in motion. Um, so anyway, the first move I'm gonna show you is um, uh, uh, gosh, no, I can't even think here because I'm in front of a crowd. Is okay. painting with light. So you're gonna your joints always have some bend to them. They're never straight, and you're really watching not lifting the shoulders up. So you're just gonna come up like you're painting the wall. Inhale, exhale, and if you want to slightly bend your knees, inhale and exhale and inhale. And exhale. Okay, another one I give is called opening the energy gates or hugging a tree. So again, you're going to inhale, then exhale. And the goal of Tai Chi is not inhale, is to really do a, a big stretch. Harvard says about 70% of the movement. You're just lubricating the joints, slowly stretching the muscles. Inhale, then exhale. Okay, now we're going to do some Tai Chi. So uh, we're going to do calming the waters. So your left foot is going to step out to at about 10 o'clock, and your right foot is, is going to be like at 12 o'clock. Your uh, back of your heel is going to stay down. And what you're basically doing is just shifting weight, and you're going to sh your uh, uh, hip bones are going to be over your knees and your thighs. So you're kind of going at an angle. And so what you're going to do is you're going to shift forward. We're going to be doing two circles. 
And then as you come back, you're going to lift your toe. And so you're going to be forward, the top of the circle. And then as you come back, lift up the toe. And that's what works on the balance. And keep the back leg soft, too. So again, if I was working with the patients, you would exhale going out and inhale coming in. So exhale. And I have to slow people down because they start going like this. Said, you know, that's, you'd be hyperventilating. And so I have to slow people down because they, they want to do things fast. And they're like, I can't do it this slow. And I said, that's what you need to be doing. Mm -hmm. So it's challenging. That's what challenges the coordination, the strength, because you're going so slow. So that's called calming the waters. And then we would switch to the right leg. It's going to be at 2 o'clock. And then we'll, we would do some on the right leg. And it really helps with people's building their activity tolerances. I had a patient who could only stand for five minutes, and now that she's practicing five days a week, I think it's your patient, she can do 55 minutes. Shoot, I thought it was the pain medicine. See, darn it. Okay, so good. <laughs> That's calming the waters. Yeah. Another one is your feet are parallel, knees soft. This is called um, pushing water to the side. So again, this is gonna be coming from the hips. Your body is gonna stay upright. So we're not gonna be doing stuff like this. And a lot of my patients have really poor, um, um, they don't know where their body is in space. They have poor proprioception, and they just they just start moving. And I go, I don't think I showed you that, but let's redo it. <laughs> you know. But anyway, okay. So you're going to shift your weight and push the water to the left, and then you're going to turn your hand over and push the water to the right. So the, a lot of the movement is from the hips. It's not from the hands. Okay. And again, you can inhale one way, and exhale the other way. You guys are all smiling now. When you first got yeah, up, you it is fun. Now you're smiling, so Joel always smiles. Okay, another one, push and pull. You're going to be diagonal again. Your left foot's going to be at 10 o'clock. It's called push okay. and pull. Again, that, that toe comes up, push. When you shift back, that toe comes up again. The back heel stays down. So this one's pretty easy because when you push, you're going to exhale. And when you come back in, you're going to inhale. And I don't mean to interrupt, but I will. So the, the breathing, like she's talking about, what Katie's teaching them, they're, they're incorporating all this together, which I think yep. is really where you get that synergy. So we really enforce synergy. each other's, mm -hmm. um, what, what the therapist is doing, we reinforce that in, in our um, practice. And then we'd switch to the right side, again, push. One, one more, Sonia? Is one more? Okay. Sorry, I know. Pull. One more movement, you mean? Yep. Okay. All right, this one's a popular one. You guys might see this in movies, out in the park. It's called hands waving clouds, clouds waving hands. So again, your feet are going to be parallel, knees soft. You can start like here. You're going to shift to the left, shift to the right. So it's kind of like a circular motion. You can inhale one way and exhale one way. Think of softness and like a like a stream just flowing. All right, thank you. Okay, good job, guys. Okay, so thank you, Sonia. Yeah, thank you. And I have to tell you, so when I see patients, I'm going over their routine. Are you doing your exercises? You know, are you doing your stretches? And I'm just amazed how much more patients than I wake up in the morning. I do my tai chi. I have another patient just this last week. I said, I wake up in the morning, and now with my wife, we do Tai Chi together. Um, and then he goes to McDonald's for his coffee and everything else. So, uh, so that's a good functional outcome for him, right? And, and he was 80, 78 years old. Do you think he was interested in Tai Chi when I first told him that that would be a treatment? No. So, OK. So we're going to talk about psychology again. I wanted to give time for Katie to do a relaxation um, demonstration. Pain psychology, again, significant evidence for cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, um, we teach a lot of mindfulness with our individual psychologic interventions, but also mindful eating, mindful exercises, doing your stretches in a mindful state. So I, again, I wish I could spend more time on it. We know it has neurochemical issues where it helps decrease pain. Um, even with relax, uh, the Tai Chi, you know, there are studies showing this is not just they're moving better, there's neurochemical changes as well. And the same with yoga. 
Um, I have to say, Dora, you did the best. You were moving the best. Some of the other guys didn't move as well, but that doesn't matter. You weren't getting rated. <laughs> now, if the yoga expert wasn't doing well, I'd be like, what? No, but good job. So, OK, so it's cognitive behavioral therapy in, or psychology. There's a lot of interventions. And so I think this is a great overview of regulatory approaches, which is really like relaxation training, behavioral approaches, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, looking at coping, stress, anxiety, um, and then ACT, which has been mentioned, acceptance, commitment-based therapy. So not everyone needs everything on the right. Maybe someone needs a little bit of both. And so having the, a, a psychologist or a counselor, they can understand that and then adapt their treatment towards that. And we have some patients that we actually send to Harborview through their PTSD treatment program first, and then continue in our pain program. Or we pick up on some issues that a patient had that our psychologist is able to pick up during the program, and when they leave the program, they work with a community provider. So every, every patient's different. Okay, so Katie, relaxation training, as I'm talking a mile a minute, so we're gonna actually slow down here. Um, so just the basic components, do you have the, you're ready to go? I think so, yep. yes, you can hear me. So, um, Relaxation training, it's great. Tai Chi and Qigong is part of that, so I have my colleagues helping me with the relaxation and also integrating that breath work. Um, at the clinic, we do a lot of autonomic nervous system education. They're really teaching people about their sympathetic system and the parasympathetic and how to tone the parasympathetic system so that they have a sense of empowerment. Um, we have biofeedback and we'll learn I think a little bit more about that. We have a great uh, biofeedback and breath coach here already. Um, so we have a couple of different strategies that we tend to teach people, trying to find one that they can really connect with. Uh, so we, you know, we talk about uh, sympathetic nervous system and more of these reactionary tendencies when they're experiencing a sensation in the body that may be unpleasant, right? So that becomes part of that positive feedback loop that sends them spiraling in continued pain. Um, so relaxation is just one of those interventions. Fortunately, we have this great integrative team, so we have multiple areas of intervention. We in, can all in consult. The, in the parasympathetic part, you're teaching that to increase parasympathetic tone. Right, right? So. yes. So the parasympathetic is that vagal nerve, and there's these two main pathways. It's the ventral vagal and the dorsal vagal. A lot of our relaxation strategies are focused on this ventral vagal response and creating a in our relaxation response, a lot of it is being calm, collected, open, able to socially engage, uh, rather than more of that really deep, like trance-like meditative state. There's some of that, some deep relaxation techniques, but really trying to tone the ventral vagal aspect of their nervous system. Well, so do you want to do your demonstration? Yes. Okay. So uh, today I thought we could just do a little guided imagery briefly. Um, Again, with chronic pain patients, there can be a tendency to exist in a lot of just negative sensory experiences constantly. So creating moments in their day where they can have a positive experience. And this, the guided imagery tends to be a little bit more of a, a disassociation from the body. We're also doing a lot of training with connecting to the body and working on that body-mind mapping. But this one's like, you know, when you want to go on a vacation, and you want to include uh, all of the senses usually in this to create positive sensory experiences with sight, sound, touch, smell, taste, right? So uh, tend to make a personal profile for everyone, try to find a good place for them because again, there can be things that are triggering for a person. So need to be aware of what, what it could be activating. So really having a trauma informed perspective with that. So I'm just gonna do kind of a generic guided imagery if any of the things that I'm prompting are activating to you, uh, feel free not to do it and to kind of create your own image instead. Uh, a thing to be aware of with people who have high levels of trauma is that there can be intrusive images happening during guided imagery. So just bringing awareness to that. So I'm just gonna have everyone, if you're comfortable, close your eyes or you can softly gaze on a place in the floor, something that's not gonna be stimulating to your mind. And then I'm gonna have you connect with your breath. So just begin to bring awareness to your breathing. And if you're able, begin to move your breath low into the diaphragm. So kind of imagining breathing into the belly, bringing some softness, allowing the breath to breathe you low and slow, 
And then begin to bring to your mind's eye an image of a coast. You find yourself standing on the shore, close to where the water is meeting the land. You're looking out at the gentle stretch of the horizon, noticing the curvature, the earth, Perhaps noticing a few small specks of boats. And you begin to trace your eyes over the water, moving towards your feet. Noticing as you do so, the way that the light glimmers on the surface of the water. The way that the water gently swells and peaks. Perhaps noticing the foam on the crest of waves. You notice that your breath is moving in sync with the rise and fall of the waves, low and slow and rhythmic. You move close to where the water is touching the shore. Notice the sea foam collecting against the sand. Noticing it as the water recedes, the foam remains. And that as the breeze gently blows, bits of that foam begins to dance across the beach, coming closer to your feet. As the breeze blows, you feel the moving tendrils of your hair, and you can taste the salt, you smell the smell of the ocean, seaweed. Continuing to breathe low and slow and rhythmically. You feel the warmth of the sun's rays on your face, not too hot, not just perfect. And for a moment, you feel a sense of belonging and connection, as if you are exactly where you should be, exactly who you should be at peace, breathing with the rhythms, the waves, and the wind. And bringing awareness back to breath, low and slow into the belly. We begin to allow the vision to fade, coming back to the body, Perhaps wiggling your fingers or toes. And slowly, at your own pace, allowing the eyes to blink open. And begin to scan the room, noticing the pattern on the carpet, the colors of the wall, and then smiling, perhaps sharing a smile with your neighbor. Very good. Excellent. Robin's going to now ask for money donations to wash out here. So, okay. Now we got you in that. Now get your wallets out. Okay. Okay. Well, that was excellent. We really wanted to highlight, again, just a couple of minutes. Again, most of our patients have never had that exposure, that kind of a, um, interaction or that learning that type of skill. So I always say that actually makes the pain medicine, everything else we're doing work a lot better. Okay. I mean, I think the opioids, this whole issue is, that's a small part of it. Because if you're going to have patients and say, oh, we're going to take you off your opioids or whatever, but not offer them something different, okay? Or not even start with opioids, but use all these techniques. I mean, we really have to change the way we think about it. Now, just to get back to the practical parts, and I know I have to get off, um, it's Swedish, we have a pain program. We take Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial. This is more for the payers, I think. Um, we showed them that our reimbursement is horrible. They don't cover, um, they don't cover, she's telling me no time left, they don't cover groups. They don't, people, some of our patients with commercial coverage pay multiple co-pays in one day. So the basic stuff that can be fixed. Um, we actually showed them our reimbursement is small, but our cost, we almost lose four to $5,000 per patient that does our pain program when we put in rent and everything else. 
Okay, so if we're going to do these things, multidisciplinary treatment and a lot of these things, if hospitals are going to do it, and I thank Swedish for um, supporting our program, um, payers really need to change. And then is this, those were, I think, the big changes need to be separate from, again, there's the opioid issue and medication reduction in that, but really the, this, the, we have to look at the practical aspects of this. This is going to be delivered in the right way. So we do a lot of education. I'm supposed to jump off the stage. So whatever this is. We like to say exercise your body, your soul, your mind, okay? And that's what I think a, a rehabilitation program, uh, however you want to put it together and cut it and, and deliver it, that's what's going to help patients, okay? Um, and I know I'm getting the dirty look here. So we'll go back to our goals. Understand challenges of chronic pain. Hopefully I gave you a little bit of insight into that. I will have, uh, I have one tool to decrease tension and calm my nervous system. You guys did. Thank you, Sonia. And... Katie, I will do Tai Chi exercises and move, and you guys did that. So I think we accomplished our goals. So thank you very much. And, 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 and really keep advocating. We really do need to advocate. A lot of the changes that we talked about were because there were 9,000 comments to the CDC about the OCDC guideline. That is great. Okay, so those are things we need to start advocating and continue to do. So thank you very much, and thanks, team. Thank you Excellent. so much. And maybe we'll just take, we have one burning, does somebody have one burning question that they would like to ask of the team? Yes, Mary. Um, how is the referral made? Can people self-refer? Does it have to be um. biased? Yeah, we have patients who are referred from the primary care or specialty care. We have self-referrals now. Patients, families, and friends find out about it. So, uh, but usually it does go through a, their primary care doctor to, um, to make sure there's no insurance issues. So. So I think we evaluate patients for pain, and sometimes we may then put them in one of our rehabilitation programs. We do have a, um, we're getting more staff as we get busier, um, but we have about a three or four week wait to get a new evaluation. Um, but uh, again, it's, we're trying to get more staff to actually be able to meet the need. We have other programs that are less intense. I showed you our most intense program here. That's the monthly program. But again, I'm using it as a model for can other systems do this? You know, the first pain rehabilitation program was at the University of Washington. John Benica started it. So, you know, uh, and we're, I always tell Dave, hopefully they'll have a program again. But John Lozier, all that work was done at the first multidisciplinary, which we now call interdisciplinary program at the University of Washington. So, That's fantastic. Thank you so, so much.